Uh, I want to welcome uh, Professor uh, Larissa Aronin, who is an associate professor at the Oranim Academic College of Education in Israel. Uh, and she's a member, um, a founder member of one of my uh, uh, favorite uh, associations, the International Association of Multilingualism. Uh, Larissa has published on a wide range. Um, I, I really can tell them all, but I will uh, uh, say some of the topics Larissa has been working with, such as third language acquisition, uh, new linguistic dispensation, dominant language constellations, and more recently on material culture and multilingualism. And through Larissa's recent work, I have to say, we now know uh, that use of material culture as an additional reliable and potent tool for sociolinguistic research on individual and group identities provides illuminating insights into minority language research, social work practices, and produces useful implications for the teaching and learning of languages. Um, just a note, I would like to call your attention to one of our most recent publications, 12 Lectures on Multilingualism, a book co-edited with David Singleton in 2019, which includes groundbreaking multidisciplinary perspectives on multilingualism. Uh, really a very interesting reading. Um, and uh, I will end with two details you should know about Larissa. And this is that uh, she is an admirable, passionate dancer and asked about her perfect balance to a stre stressful working day. She answered ballroom dancing, salsa and yoga. So if you want to learn how to dance, Larissa is the perfect teacher uh, for you. And I saw it live. So um, I can tell you, you will learn a lot with her. But today she's not speaking about salsa and ballroom dance. She will uh, 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 teach us or make a, call, um, a very interesting intervention on linguistic landscapes and the material culture of multilingualism. Thank you, Larissa, for joining us. Um. Thank you, Sylvia, so much for this wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to this so very interesting event. I already learned a lot. And um, so I would like to thank you for inviting me. And um, after the inspiring talks by Daniel and Alice, I would like to just start a little bit with linguistic landscape and uh, then I will speak about material culture. Just a second. Share. Um, do, uh, okay. do you see my presentation? Yes, now we can see it. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, I was asked to speak about contacts in Israel, therefore, all my examples will come from different populations in Israel, but you should know there's a lot around the world. This is our plan, so if you think how long it's going to be, you can, you can always have a look. So, um, the international journal dedicated to linguistic landscape defines it as advertisements and commercials and names of buildings and streets and shops and instructions and warning signs and uh, in short forms of languages as they are displayed in public spaces. Uh, Landrian Boris stimulated an enthusiastic stream of studies on the linguistic landscape in various places of the world, and um, they originally defined linguistic landscape as referring to the visibility and salience of languages on public and commercial signs. Uh, current research on linguistic landscape has expanded impressively, you all know about that. I want just to stress that it spread into environment, and as Bailey and colleagues 
put it, unpacking the significance of context. That's what we saw in Daniel's presentation. She uh, underlined the environment where linguistic landscape is. Um, so most of the studies that followed emphasized the hierarchy of languages in a particular community or area. And then consequent power relations between languages and communities as they transpire through the linguistic landscape. And then the studies by Porter and colleagues elucidated that the linguistic landscape approach not only studies the science, but it investigates as well who initiates, creates, places and roots them. And this is what Vivian Cook did expertly, brilliantly and elegantly in a sequence of his recent studies related to the linguistic landscape. Thus, the linguistic landscape studies have accumulated a valuable database of uh, facts and ideas, so we can say that the important dimension of physical environment did not go unnoticed. With that, to date, only with some exceptions, research has covered only certain kind of environment items, mostly science in place and mostly in public spaces. But what compels us to limit our educational curiosity and teaching creativity with only one portion of the surrounding world? Why not examine and involve into educational practice and in the entire realm of material culture, rather than only fragments of it. Why don't we go further in linking languages with the physical environment where they are used? The need to do so has been encouraged by the recent advances in science. We have a long tradition of debate on externalism, extended mind and extended cognition in philosophy of mind and cognitive studies. And this per perspective is a prominent way of seeing cognition as extending the mind beyond the skull into the whole body, rather than seeing it as limited only to the brain, and further to the cultural world surrounding an individual. <clears throat> the extended mind view holds that environment has an active role in driving cognitive processes and, of course, related to language. Artifacts are fundamental to human cognition and perception. Therefore, uh, there is a new term, metaplasticity, to denote the emerging intertwining between neural and cultural plasticity, the notion of brain artifact interface which relates to the point of intersection between cognition and material culture. And Lambras Malafouris underscores the inseparability of thought, action and material things in his material engagement theory. So the environment of our students and pupils is replete with material artifacts and objects, including technologically enabled <coughs> materialities so it is only logical that working for global language education in the school context, we expand our purview to the entire material culture. Being part of everyday experience, artifacts, commodities, buildings, domestic utensils, instruments, memorabilia, and all other things represent always available but too often unrecognized hard material for the benefit of teaching practices and evidence for research. Material objects are mostly solid, corporeal, physical and concrete. They have form, volume, texture, width, size, smell and in time. They are of course very visual, as Silvia would say. <laughs> Things are engaged in social discourse, or rather they themselves serve as a special kind of social discourse. They can provide immediate reaction to whatever happens in society. Here is an example. 
um, you can see immediate reaction to something that happens, for example, uh, in Great Britain. But also you can see a nice mark in Russian, which says, eat less. Well, this person, a uh, certain official in one of the Russian cities, famously said in response to difficult financial circumstances, uh, to eat less. That's, that was his idea of how to cope with that. So he enraged citizens and they produced this piece of material culture. Solid evidence is so unusual for multiple language acquisition studies and multilingualism. But we should bear in mind that material culture can help teachers in their judgment of educational situations and in teaching languages. Linguistic landscapes are dynamic in a way, you know. But in order to fulfill their role and to acquire their intended meaning, the signs typically have to stay put. They have to be in place. In their turn, objects and artifacts are very often portable and movable in many different ways. One might think about souvenirs that are brought from other countries, pendants that we wear near our heart, a favorite vase brought um, by an immigrant to a new life and kept in the new home for many years, and then handed on to children and grandchildren, which thus assures the ethnic identity and vitality of a minority language. Materialities carry out innumerable social functions and thus provide multitude of opportunities to modify social and educational encounters. Many objects generate emotional and cognitive stimuli. Such objects may trigger an emotion or source nostalgia, elicit pride or anger, attraction, interest or curiosity, thus acting as affordances linked to language attitudes, learning motivation and cognition. Some materialities label a person or community and define him or her in an official or unofficial manner, and by this can modify life of our students, pupils and self-perception. Here you can see different uh, language defined shirts. Age has its own story. I can tell you if you ask me later or if you read uh, the articles which I can um, tell you about. So um, these things always represent, uh, um, have communicative functions. Um, for example, this young man in the center, he's a Russian speaker using English and Hebrew, and uh, he has this inscription in English, which makes him show his own cultural preferences, because this is not just he, that what he thinks about himself, but uh, in reality, this is a quotation for a very well-known dance song by a popular English pop band, Right Said Fred. Objects and artifacts exist both in public and in the private sphere, and also in between. This is very important about material culture, because it gets into the spaces which formerly we could not look at. So we are now in the private sphere in the home. You will see it my next example from an Arab-speaking Christian community in Israel. This, um, this came from the Rama village located in the Upper Galilee. And this is a mixed village consisting of Druze, Muslims and Christians, with Christians being the minority. So Hani Kassis, a teacher and researcher, and in the time of project he was also a student, he conducted a research on two homes, two families. And the these family members um, use the same, uh, they are of the same speech community and both are religious orthodox. 
Now, what Hani did, he just photographed items with an inscribed language, with an inscribed languages in both houses, and then divided the pictures into three categories for analysis. And this is what he saw. You could see already that the row, one row uh, contains Armenian language. This is the heritage language of one of the families. So it turns out that everyday items are done in Hebrew and Arabic for both of the families, while something that is very close to the soul, religion, culture, is um, they use the heritage language, mostly Armenian, um, in one of the families. So that's a very interesting finding. Speaking about homes, where multilingual language users and learners live in Israel, let us now move to yet another community, now Turkesian community. Okay, this is a linguistic landscape. <laughs> you can see uh, the sign to the Kfar, uh, Kfar Kama village in three languages, uh, Hebrew, Turkesian, and English. That's what you can see from the sign. But in fact, if you go deeper, people speak about five, six languages daily. And you see, uh, have a look, please, what we can gather from looking at the material items of one of the family. First of all, you can see the artifact uh, standing. It's a small memorial table teller with the information in Hebrew. It stands right near the plate with Arabic inscriptions. The positioning of the table teller inside the home, but within the zone of public display, conveys the feelings of loss and sadness in this family and also shares it with the community. The variety of artifacts and material objects with inscriptions in different languages um, show us a lot of things about the people in this community. For example, the artifact which is in the middle, it's a door. Actually, a door is the border of the public and private domains. And we can see here, or a visitor sees humorous stickers in Hebrew, a no smoking sign and a Hebrew sticker asking who is here. And then there is also a copper relief on the same door, which bears embossed print in Russian. Uh, and the bar relief portrays the glory of a Turkishian wearer. So artifacts used by Turkishian people in Israel who mostly use Arabic language, they display their current language, their heritage language, and also their ways of life traditions, values, their own vision of their future and of history. And the next slide shows their vision of history. This is a sticker which is in mother's bedroom. And it's a message in English to remember massacres in russian Turkish war, 1864. 200 of years have passed, but now we are informed that uh, people remember and it's very important for them. So, um, the next idea is that materialities are very good for teaching and learning because of a very special quality which is called effective understanding. Um, the feature of effective understanding explains the fact that many objects generate cognitive stimuli and uh, makes material culture items highly relevant for the education and teaching. Due to this feature, some things may be brought to a classroom or used for other types of language acquisition and learning. And um, items might be used in a classroom to improve memorization, lead to deeper understanding and create motivation. And I will show you an example from now Arab Muslim community, which illustrates a case where there are three generations of women that maintain the mastery of a 
a Czech language in the midst of Arabic speaking community. And these are the material items that were used by these women with their children for home learning. Another example is from the Russian-speaking family. Again, connected to learning, you could see books, shelves with the books, and you could see that several of the books um, in different languages actually are the same. So, is there any cognitive need to have the same books in different languages on the shelf? And now, as... Um, as Daniel nicely put the question, I would like to ask you too. So what? What can the teachers do already now in order to improve the language education and react to the current world around us? We can do all kinds of things. We can describe, interpret and analyze separate objects and artifacts and also multilingual spaces and scenes the um, things can be characterized from a variety of viewpoints because of the interpretable attributes of size, texture, smell, inscriptions, place they are in, and so on. Thick descriptions and other qualitative research techniques um, may be very helpful. Um, also, it is possible to follow separate object trajectories and it's an exciting way of looking at your students or them looking into their own identities. And um, we can see that the role of languages and their corresponding cultures may be easily misjudged in the world of ideas, assumptions and emotions. But knowing de facto situation with their materialities, we can have a possibility to control over what we see and to see what is it in realities. For example, my last example is about simply counting the linguistically defined objects. Uh, this is the study from an Arab home of the English teacher in Israel. Prior to looking at materialities, um, present, present in her family house, the teacher student by name Amel noted that Arab culture was tremendously important for the family and that she and her husband made significant efforts to make it foremost in their home. In a study, Amel just counted language defined objects and then she collected 556 artifacts and most of them were English scribed, and some even had Russian inscriptions. So their results led uh, her to realization of a family actual multilingual lifestyle, and to what extent the material environment shows the style, the languages, and the cultures. So, and uh, Amel said, that it's powerful to make statements with artifacts. And conclusions that uh, the aim of research in multi material culture of multilingualism is not to study materialities for their own sake, but rather to find out how materialities are connected with and influence language practices, early language development, language teaching, and identity of multilinguals. And uh, importantly, that material culture is a highly appropriate interest for personal and not only for public spaces. And these are some references. You can look at them later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laisa. Thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, it's very nice uh, to get to know a bit uh, about the linguistic landscape, uh, cultural and linguistic landscape in Israel. So now we have five minutes for your questions. You can post your questions in the chat. Yes. 
so uh, Larissa, uh, you can see that now we have a first question. What about those artifacts with no languages that the students relate to languages? Mm -hmm. Um, so you, I didn't quite, uh, I didn't hear it quite well. So you are asking, what are those artifacts that, uh, with uh, without inscriptions, right? That's what you mean. Well, Mo uh, yes, this is uh, Monica questions. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see it in the chat, but I'm going to repeat it. What about those artifacts with no languages that students relate to languages? Right. Okay. These artifacts are also multilingual artifacts because they are presented or they are used in the society where other languages are used. And once the artifact, even if the, in the without the language inscription, is there, then it means it's part of the bigger picture with languages heard or used around it. So it has to be counted as an artifact, and it's very important indeed to see in which environment it is. Did I answer? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Larissa. Do you have more questions? No, I think that that is for now. So um, later, uh, Larissa, later you are going to share your presentation with us. For of the course. Question. So maybe if someone else has a question, uh, you can post it there. And maybe you can also reply in the classroom. All so, right. Thank you very much, Larissa. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, Silvia or Joanna, um, I don't know if you want to add something. Yes, yes, of course. Material culture not only can improve language awareness, it does improve it because we feel things, we feel languages in our hands. Of course, what a great question. <laughs> <laughs>